Good afternoon. We're very excited this afternoon to present to you a special Farm Doc webinar entitled Food and Agriculture in the 21st Century. And we have a very esteemed presenter today, Dr. Robert Easter, Professor Emeritus of Animal Science, Dean Emeritus here in the College of Aces at the University of Illinois, and also President Emeritus of the University of Illinois, and one of the world's foremost swine nutrition experts. That's how I first got to know Dr. Easter. So very excited to hear his perspectives on these important broad themes about where we're heading in the next century with regard to food and agriculture. So what we're going to do today, Dr. Easter is going to speak about uh, someplace between around 45 minutes, and that will leave us about 10, 15 minutes for questions, and then we'll yeah. cut it off as one like we usually do. Dr. Easter, take it away, and thank yeah. you very much for joining us. Well, and thank you, Dr. Irwin. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, you made it clear that I'm not an economist. I'm an <laughs> animal scientist, and I, that's an important point. I, I guess over time I've evolved into more of a general agriculturalist as I've had various responsibilities. And uh, I've had the privilege of, over the last 40-odd years, traveling to most of the ag food-producing regions of the world and kick the dirt and get some sense of what, what's out there. So to be clear, what I'm saying today is an opinion. It's just based on my experience and perspectives. And I, I'm going to speak broadly and not in depth about any particular topic. We may want to do that in the Q&A session. But the question of the day is pretty obvious. Uh, most predictions are that we're going to be dealing with a population that has about 2 billion more people by 2050, unless there's some major catastrophe. And the question today is, does the world's food system actually have the capacity to, to provide adequate nutrition to that population? And we've got a poll here that you might want to respond to uh, that uh, before we get underway that would give you some idea of, uh, give us some idea of what, what your thoughts actually, actually are. And we'll give you just a moment to do that. And we thank everyone for filling in our poll. Interesting answer, right, Rob? Right. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, what's interesting is that uh, uh, the dominant – clearly 90 percent of our audience thinks that the answer is, yep, we're going to feed everybody. Um, I'd agree with that. But what I find interesting is that it's going to take significant use of new technologies. Um, and also interesting that uh, relatively few thought that it would take additional acreage. So – um, message I take from this a real faith that technology is the, the key, and I'm optimistic that that's the correct answer as well. At least it's a it's a good answer to the question, and I think most of the audience probably is aware that this is not a new question for humanity. And Parson Malthus is famous for an essay that he wrote back in the late 1700s, essentially putting forth the theory that. Uh, Population without any particular restraints grows geometrically, and that his observation is that the supply of food increases arithmetically. And with that, you rather quickly arrive to a rapidly growing population, and at some point the line intersects as food supply doesn't increase at that rate, and uh, there's a catastrophe as a, as a result of that. Well, the reality over the last uh, hundred or several hundred years is that that hasn't been the case, uh, but there have been a number of, of causes of, of food insufficiency, and these are well-known, uh, drought, poverty, conflict is a major source, a lack of access, lack of technology, and in serious cases, lack of access to technology, and sometimes uh, policies do get uh, put in place that are inappropriate, and those have to be corrected. Uh, animal disease, plant disease affecting uh, food supply is, is certainly there. And there's a lot of conversation these days about climate change. And I think to some extent as though it were a new, a new issue. But I would remind you that back in the uh, several hundred years ago, we went through a little ice age in, in at least the northern hemisphere. And uh, there was a dip in temperatures that was particularly sensitive in, in Europe. Uh, between about 1300 to about almost 1900. And uh, before that, there had been expansion of, of human uh, population into the northern parts of Europe and even into Greenland. 
uh, and Iceland and uh, temperatures for reasons that were, uh, one would assume, brought on by natural phenomenon, decline a couple of degrees C. And with that, uh, food supplies were reduced. And uh, as a consequence, there was conflict, there was an increase in disease and so forth. So climates do change for a number of reasons. And when that takes place, it can have impacts on food supply. Of course, today we have available to us technologies to deal with these things that might not have been available uh, during that era. Uh, populations uh, continue to grow. Uh, if you look at the, the growth from a uh, couple hundred years, a uh, couple thousand years ago until today, until 1900 on this slide, you can see the world moving from a few million, 200 million, up to 1.6 billion by the beginning of the 1900s, last century. And since that time, uh, we've added massively to the world's population, uh, somewhere north of 7 billion people now on, our, on the planet. And the interesting dimension has been the extent to which that population is relocating uh, from uh, rural areas uh, where food production is local into urban settings. And certainly that creates uh, challenges as one thinks about uh, infrastructure and how do you provision uh, those folks living remotely from the areas where food can be produced. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> in the human experience, uh, Inadequate food supply is not a new, a new phenomenon and not a new experience. Uh, I pull this uh, photo off of a, of a, of a uh, story or an article about India, uh, but it certainly is not unique. It's been a case in many, many different uh, parts of the world. And it was typically relatively considered a local situation uh, uh, throughout much of history. Uh, it's unfortunate. You don't have enough food. You've got to figure out how to solve the problem. Uh, around the time of the Second World War, uh, leading up to during the conflict and then certainly after the conflict, it became more of an issue that was being discussed globally uh, by individuals in uh, positions of leadership, I would guess in part because of increased communication, just access to the news of what was going on. Uh, certainly, there were a number of individuals, all millions of people who had been impacted personally uh, by food shortages during the Second World War, during the conflict, and the public was increasingly sensitive to a humanitarian perspective on this issue. Uh, they had gone through the Depression, the uh, Great Economic Depression. There was this personal understanding of what it meant to not have enough food. And uh, for many of those who had actually been involved in the conflict, they understood that food insufficiency provoked political instability. Uh, I just was reading a couple of days ago an, an interesting um, article about the, why, did the, uh, why did the Nazis invade Germany? And uh, the term that gets used is living space. In actual fact, they were interested in food because they'd been you deficient in this art. Invading in Russia. 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 Yeah. Russia. Russia, you know, opening up some of the vast uh, agricultural areas of that of that area, Ukraine in particular, uh, to gain access because of the experience they'd had during the First World War when there was food insufficiency in the time after that. Food, lack of food. Uh, there's this old adage that uh, if you have if you don't have enough food, you have one problem. If you have enough food, you can have many problems. And we tend to focus when we're hungry on solving our immediate and most serious problem. And there's no doubt that uh, dressing food was a part of the engagement during the the uh, uh, the, uh, the era of, of uh, the Cold War as an instrument of so power. I think those in the United States, in particular, but also in in Europe, Western Europe, were aware of the enormous in increases that had been made in productivity between about 1900 and 1950 as a lot of new technologies, a lot of innovation in the agricultural system had been developed and put in place. And the notion was that those kinds of advances could be also put in place and uh, further developed in other parts of the world. And there are a variety of institutions that were created to actually go about doing this. Initially, things like the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, and eventually those got converted into um, more institutional, government-supported uh, organizations, the Consultative Group for International Agriculture Research, 
uh, the FAO, and so forth. But again, the focus on increasing food productions. And several factors were brought to play. Certainly, improved crop genetics was important in the 1950s and 60s in dramatically increasing the supply of food. Uh, and sometimes it tends to be overemphasized, but there was agronomy that was brought into play that was important. Uh, fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer and the expansion of the capacity to, to do that. <laughs> The use of irrigation where previously irrigation systems had not had not been in place. Mechanization, increasing the ability of a single individual to produce more food than ever in, in the history of humankind through mechanization and improved farming practice. Expansion of, of the land that was cultivated and underlying much of this is the research and educational systems that have been put in place. I'd point out before we leave this slide that Fossil fuels were critical to this. And as we think about the future of availability of, of fossil fuels, fertilizer production, irrigation, and mechanization all require energy of some sort. And uh, the conversations about how we meet those needs as we go into another century down the road, I think, will continue to be important. There's no question, but there was dramatic success in most of these efforts. And I just show here the the success that was achieved with wheat, uh, wheat yields more than uh, quadrupling or tripling as you go from 1950 out to uh, the current uh, 2004 era. And <clears throat> the individual that has gets a lot of credit not only for some of the discoveries related to improved wheat genetics, but also more importantly perhaps than that, uh, having the vision to get these incorporated globally into the production system and being able to be as an, a very effective communicator, uh, uh, convincing governments, convincing individuals to adopt new technologies. Norman Borlaug uh, received the Nobel Prize uh, in uh, uh, 1970, Nobel Peace Prize for his contributions to, to, world, to world peace. And uh, some have credited him with saving a billion lives. Uh, certainly there were many others that were involved in this, but he's the individual who's generally recognized as being as the person in leading these efforts. Well, we became complacent. And from the time that uh, I began my career in the 1970s and through to the first decade of, of the current millennium, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on a need to increase food production. Uh, in fact, uh, prices tend to be low and we tended to focus on having too much and viewing that as a bit of a problem. The world's attention was captured in uh, around 2007, 8 and through in 2009 by shortages that were brought on by, uh, there was drought in Australia that impacted wheat production, also in the, the wheat belt of the United States. The Indian government changed some policies, a number of things. It was real. There was a food crisis in this era. And if you were in a limited resource environment where you were spending 70 or 80 percent of your available resources, whatever that might be, to supply food for your family, and that cost doubled, uh, you were, in a sense, underwater. A lot of factors involved, and I've listed these here and mentioned them earlier. Population had continued to grow. Uh, economic growth had, had driven dietary changes. There had been a diminishment in the investment in science and development. And uh, the question that often gets debated in this part of the world, uh, Scott, is whether or not biofuel, uh, use of some of the cereals for biofuel was a factor in this. One thing that is not controversial is the fact that in those parts of the world where food was indeed in, in limited supply and prices were a factor in people being able to eat adequately, there was conflict. And this is an interesting slide because it depicts the numbers of individuals who lost their lives actually in civil unrest uh, during that period of time. And you notice the increases take place as food prices go up and then they go down as food prices uh, diminish. Uh, this created a lot of interest in dealing with the, the issue. So. I want to turn to the future and uh, speak a little bit about uh, where, we're, where we might be headed. All indications are that the human population on the earth is going to continue to grow. Uh, most things that I read suggest that after 30 years it might begin to, to, to slow down a bit. Certainly there will be some changes. It will be an older population. But 
uh, we come up with these estimates of roughly two additional billion people. Today, there are somewhere, you look at various estimates, under a billion people, but a huge number, regard, irregardless, <laughs> 700 to 950 million, varying on which estimate you look at, who are insufficiently nourished. And if you consider this strictly as an energy or calorie situation, that's a, a number. But if you also look at those who may be deficient in something like, say, vitamin A or whatever, inadequate nutrition, it, it's even larger than that. And if you look at the media, uh, you can see um, articles reporting on this in different different parts of the world. Well, we're looking to the future. And uh, the point I want to begin with is uh, our populations are moving to urban settings, and uh, some of these are huge. Uh, as I travel around the world and, and look at major cities, Tokyo, the Tokyo metropolitan area approaching 40 billion people, uh, I first went to Shanghai in the 1980s, and I could see food being brought in on bicycles from the nearby countryside. Today, as I go into Shanghai, I don't see food production for miles and miles from the center of the, the city. So how does one create an infrastructure, uh, a logistical system that allows you to, uh, to, to get the food to where the people are? Uh, I make this comment regularly in conversations. When I was a child in the 1950s, food production for most of the world was a relatively local activity. In fact, I would assume that most of what I ate growing up was produced within a few hundred miles of where, where we actually lived. Today, it's a global enterprise, and I think it, some people are a bit shocked when I show data that say that Perhaps 50% or more of the fresh fruit we eat in this country comes from somewhere else in the world, 20% of our vegetables. And interestingly enough, things like avocados, I think it's up to about 90 some mm. percent of those being imported. Love those food avocados. System, I love those avocados. <laughs> that guacamole is wonderful. The food system is a global enterprise, and uh, certainly local production is, is part of that. But uh, massive amounts of food and moving them around the world is a major global global enterprise, and it is vulnerable. As I think about the future, I think of four things we need to do, and obviously we need to produce more, and that is the focus of most most conversations. But I think there are three other areas that need to be focused on as well. We need to be careful to prevent loss of that which is produced. <clears throat> and uh, here in the Midwest, we do a pretty good job of that. We have good systems for storing our maize, our corn. Uh, for storing wheat and so forth, so and harvesting and transporting. So the losses are very minimal. Many, many parts of the world are not nearly so fortunate. It's estimated today that perhaps 30% of the world's food is lost somewhere between the harvest and the consumer. Uh, having been in, I'll show you a picture in a minute, having been in some of those parts of the world, I can understand that. These are some personal photos, except for one here, that I made traveling around uh, drying systems. <clears throat> Uh, we're accustomed here in the Midwestern United States to using fossil fuels to dry our grains pretty effectively. In other parts of the world, it's sunshine, and uh, you spread the grain out on the ground or on some sort of surface, and contamination takes place, losses occur. And, and storage systems, the picture here actually from the North India Post, uh, they, I've, I've talked quite a bit with ind officials in India uh, about these systems and asked the question, well, why don't you convert to just simple silos like we would use here? And there's a social issue. There's 600,000 people whose employment is based on handling bags of grain. So what do you do with those if you go to an automated uh, type of system? Uh, the ADM, the corporation, uh, several years ago gave a very large gift to the university to establish an institute focused on post-harvest loss. And I volunteer with that organization a bit. And we were in eastern India about 18 months ago looking at a village where there's no electricity, there's no fuel other than what you can gather. And they're harvesting their next six months supply of corn to store in their house that's going to be the family's primary energy source for that period of time. And it's raining. How do you dry how do you dry that? And there's a small dryer that uh, has been developed by the project is a possible way of, of doing that. Storage bags are important and I just point out in this household that we were visiting, that's our supply. That's our food supply, their cereal supply for the next several months. 
How do you prevent uh, damage to that? How do you prevent insects from getting into it? Uh, other things that would destroy its quality. Another thing, and I'm biased, of course, as an animal scientist, uh, we need to produce more. We produce, prevent loss of what's produced, increase the efficiency of animal production. Uh, when you hear the surface conversation about feeding two more billion people, the term that what you often hear is we need to double food production. But in reality, we're increasing the population only by about 25%. But around the world, food patterns are changing. Individuals are becoming more affluent. And as economies grow and there's more disposable income, the, the food budget shifts away from very basic uh, ingredients to, to fruits, vegetables, and in many cases, animal products, depending on what part of the world you're in. That may, may vary quite a bit of what it may be. But it's in developing countries where we see fairly dramatic increases in animal production and consumption of, of animal products. <clears throat> I started, as I indicated, going to China in the 1980s. And between about 1990 and 2005, which is where I drew this data from FAO, uh, it was interesting to observe as you traveled around the country uh, the changing food habits of individuals and comparing that to India and Brazil, actually a bit of a decrease in cereals, or, but production of other crops, oils, meat, milk, milk up by 200 percent, fish the, and fruits, 250 percent, vegetables, the changing dietary patterns and production demands. U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service does some uh, summaries uh, or projections and also current data. This runs from 2015 out through 2026. It looks at global poultry <clears throat> and production and use pretty much line up, but look at the slope of, of that line. It's a bit aggregated by the, exaggerated by the scale we're using, but nonetheless, a rather substantial increase. Look at pork, and this will change this year, certainly, with African swine fever, but uh, an increase. And interestingly enough, as you would expect, uh, the demand for the ingredients, the feed ingredients that produce those, those uh, meat products, goes up almost in the same fashion. In this case, uh, soybean meal, the crop, soybean protein, soybeans being produced, and the increase in production and utilization pretty much paralleling. Uh, if you do some interesting back-of-the-envelope calculations, that's a growth of about 12 million tons, metric tons per year of uh, soybean uh, use. Run that on out to 2050, and if we continue to grow animal consumption, animal product consumption at that rate as we are today, it would basically require us to, demand, to double the soybean production in, in the world again. So the topic that comes up is planetary boundaries. Uh, I was in Europe last week to speak at a conference uh, by a poultry group, and uh, the question that was on the table is, does the planet actually have the capacity to sustainably increase to produce at levels that one might expect based on what we've just discussed? And uh, that, I think, is a, an interesting question to contemplate. So it brings you quickly to discussions of alternative proteins, and I'll not spend much time on this. There's a product in the market locally now called Just Egg, which uh, I've tried it. We took it home, made an omelet, and uh, it did a reasonable job of doing that. Uh, the question that comes immediately to mind is, and you can't calculate it based on the ingredients alone. You'd have to know their percentages in the, in the material. The question is, is it nutritionally similar to an egg? An egg is pretty darn good in terms of meeting nutritional requirements for a growing young person. And I'm not quite sure at this point where this is. It'd be interesting actually to know that. Well, the last thing I want to mention here is protect the capacity to produce. Uh, certainly, uh, it's something that uh, is not a new topic. Uh, resource conservation is, has been something that we've talked about for a long time. And uh, a number of years ago, I was thinking about this in the term sustainability, and I asked one of my colleagues, uh, how do you define sustainability? And he's an engineer whose career has been devoted to working on the food system for the proposed uh, trip to Mars. So you're going to have astronauts on a, on a vehicle, it's going to be in space for a long period of time and no possibility of carrying along enough food to make the entire voyage. So you create some kind of food production system. 
And he said, Bob, as we've thought about this, we can't add anything once we lift off. We just have to make it work with what we have on board. He said, as I think about sustainability, I think about planet Earth as in a similar sense as a vehicle moving through space. And uh, you can't add anything to that. You can certainly change forms. You can do things with the assets you have. But somehow you have to, within those limitations, be successful in producing, in the case of the space voyage, uh, enough food to sustain, uh, sustain the astronauts. We'll talk a little bit about, in that regard, water. And uh, we all know what water is. We, we, we use it regularly for a lot of things. Uh, and there's a lot of water on the surface of the Earth, as you well know. There's oceans and seas that are brimming with water, but the reality is a really limited amount of that is available to us as fresh water, which can be used in uh, crop animal production and sustaining human, human life. So as I talk about water, I want to tell a bit of a personal story. And uh, my, I began life in a very rural part of southwest Texas, not far from the border with, uh, with Mexico, an area that uh, has an annual rainfall naturally less than, less than 20 inches. So it's, it's not an area that you'd expect to have abundant crop uh, agriculture. But in the early 1900s, it was discovered that if you bored a well, uh, made a, a, a well into the, into the, into the earth, uh, water would just bubble out on the surface. It was artesian. It was just wonderful. And my grandparents at the time were living in Missouri. They made a trip, and they thought, this is going to be a wonderful place to be. We can do agriculture there. It could be like the Central Valley of California and a great place to grow vegetables, fruits, and a number of other things. And uh, they moved into an area that had a, a, a lot of uh, interesting communities that had been established, most of them having some reference to, to water, artesia wells, big wells, uh, Carrizo Springs, and so forth. Life was good. And uh, for several decades, it was a major area of uh, vegetable production and uh, claimed to be the spinach capital of the world back in the 19, 1930s. And that's the world that I grew up in. <clears throat> and uh, there's Bob, that's me, about 1954, dad irrigating crops with some of the most inefficient uses of water <laughs> that one can imagine, but we didn't understand that at that time. I was watching the national news a few years ago, and uh, up pops this photograph of our neighbor. Oh, my gosh. And uh, he was. this was actually a CNN story that was done. It was a drought. And... Uh, the point of the art of the story was that this area had once been irrigated massively, and the water supply just wasn't available to do that any longer. And so if you think about it, the it, aquifers of Texas are depicted here. Uh, the major aquifer that we were drawing water from in our area is known as the Carrizo Aquifer, and over time it was depleted. It was geologic water, by and large. The recharge rate was much less than, uh, than was needed to, to maintain the capacity. So uh, Dad's advice to me as a youngster was there's not going to be much of a future here in agriculture. You better find another place to or another career from, from that. Well, in 2015, I was in northern India. We were about 100 miles north of New Delhi in, in what might be described as a wheat belt and out visiting farmers who were very excited about some machinery that they had purchased and they were getting ready to do their, their harvest. And as, as we sat in the shade of a tree and talked about their agriculture, one of the questions that came up was, um, what are some of your challenges? That's the question you usually ask a group of farmers, what's your biggest problem? And they talked about the price of electricity and uh, the fact that their water supply was uh, every year they had to lower their pumps to a deeper level in, in the wells. And I began to think about my own experience and uh, the fact that I too had lived in a part of the world with a declining water supply. And I went back to Delhi and began to ask people in ministries there, what is the situation for water in India? Uh, the report I got and uh, was that there's about 20 years worth of water before some of the major aquifers in that country become 
in a critical condition because it's being depleted at a rate that's rapid and, and more rapid than, than recharge. And I'm not particularly using India as a, as a unique example. There are many other parts of the world where this is the case. But if you think about Borlaug's Green Revolution and the slide that we showed early on, irrigation was a major factor in increasing the, the food supply and actually allowing India to become a, a wheat exporter. And uh, the well, That's interesting. Yeah. Just one yeah. point here. That's in lots of the Green Revolution countries. In the United States, we've been blessed to not have to rely on to that anywhere near that degree on irrigation, it, even though it's big in the U.S. It uh, and you know when I moved from Texas to Illinois, mm-hmm. and every rain every week it rained, and the crops just grew. I was amazed, <laughs> having, having spent my career, my early life in a very very different different world. I think the challenge that you have to think about is there are parts of the world that have been food self-sufficient because they've been able to irrigate, and that changes. It's the largest groundwater utilizer user in the world, and uh, it's 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 a it's a major issue in, in that in that country, and certainly they're very aware of it, obviously, and uh, they're very focused on addressing some of these things. Uh, Water can become a the most limiting factor in food production, if one thinks about it. And the competition, and I'm very sensitive to this because it goes on in, back in my area of Texas, the competition between the cities who desperately need water for their, for their populations and food-producing areas can be very serious, it's, as we know it is today in California, for example. Uh, depletion. Another issue that in some areas is the loss of reservoir storage capacity. In our country in the 1940s, 30s through the 50s and 60s, we built a number of massive storage reservoirs that uh, allowed us to capture water and then distribute it downstream during periods of of need for irrigation. And uh, loss of capacity is taking place. An issue that... uh, doesn't often get into the public discourse, although the National Geographic had a wonderful story on this about a year ago, is the contamination of of water. Uh, In India today, as the aquifers are being depleted, rock-containing arsenic is being exposed. And when exposed to oxygen, it becomes, and I'm not a geophysicist, so I can't explain this, it becomes uh, soluble. So you see water being taken out for human use that's no longer safe because of the increased level of oxygen. Well, and I just point out here on this slide some of the areas of the world where arsenic uh, can be a potential potential challenge. In the 1930s were a, 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 a transformational period in the United States. As many of you would know, the, uh, the areas in, in the Great Plains have been put to agriculture and plowed, the prairie sod had been plowed, put to agriculture, and the methods that were being used uh, made it vulnerable to erosion, particularly by wind in areas, in times of insufficient rainfall. There's some horrible photos from that from that period. And that brought a lot of attention on the need to conserve soil. And I think in that generation, that era, conserving meant just keeping it, uh, keeping it there. And uh, there's a wonderful, if you're interested, there's a wonderful series uh, called The Dust Bowl by Ken Burns that is available to, uh, to look at to talk about that era. But over the last decade or so, we've become, we move beyond just conserving soil and protecting the, keeping the soil available to a conversation about soil health and the realization that there's a lot more to soil. It's not dirt. It's a living organism, in a sense, with a myriad of microbes. It's a, uh, a lot of uh, products of decaying plant material and so forth that contribute uh, to the health of the, of the capacity of the soil to continue to be productive and functional. And certainly, as we think about this planet <coughs> with, uh, where you can't add anything, we can't create new soil overnight if we allow some of our soils to be degraded. So protecting that capacity to produce is certainly important. It's been the case in Illinois 100 years ago when we were heavily involved in in the Industrial Revolution where we contaminated soils with heavy metals. 
A uh, recent report shows some of the contamination that's occurred in China. They've become very conscious of this now and are, are dealing with it. Well, as I reached, come here to, to a point, if you will, of summary and looking to where we go over the next 20 or 30 years, uh, some of the challenges that uh, I think humanity faces is uh, a need to innovate uh, and uh, the question of whether or not uh, we have the, the structures in place uh, to support and cause the appropriate innovations to occur. Uh, there's a whole host of issues around the food supply that are basically policy driven. Uh, they're political. Uh, it's difficult for innovations to be incorporated into production systems if there's financial instability and uh, investments need to be made over a long term and uh, in an unstable environment uh, investors or even farmers are, are not encouraged to do that. Uh, there's questions about uh, what some would refer to as social license. license. Uh, will some of the technologies that uh, could be involved in increasing food production be uh, made considered appropriate by society at large? And will farmers be encouraged or allowed to, in fact, use that? Uh, national policies impact land use, uh, employment of technology, particularly here for us in the Midwest, the inadequacy of an infrastructure. Uh, we are in a time when we need to do some things with our locks and dam system. It's been a topic of conversation since, Scott, as long as I can remember, and yet we, don't, we don't seem to be making much progress in that regard, and it's the same in other, other parts of the world. I think a question that comes to the table more and more is are there actually biological limitations to how far we can push plant systems and animals it's encouraging one of our colleagues here at the university of illinois with a major major investment from the gates foundation has been able to develop methods that could perhaps increase photosynthesis by up to 30 percent so there may be ways of uh, pushing uh, plant capture of solar energy and converting it into useful things for humans uh, that go beyond what might naturally be the case. Uh, we always worry about a what some would call a black swan event, an unanticipated plant disease, or as we're seeing in, globally in the swine industry today, African swine fever is an un... We've certainly been aware of it for a long time, but no one, I think, anticipated the extent that it could devastate production systems in various parts of the world. And then the unknown around climate change and how that will impact. I showed at the very outset... Uh, uh, a time in our history where there were some changes in climate and it had significant impact on human existence. And going forward, uh, uh, there certainly is an opportunity to see changes there. Uh, as I think about that <clears throat> I, and look at those kind of predictions that are being made about, made about conditions that might exist 30 or 50 or 100 years from now, I also realize that Almost, I can't find a single one of those where somewhere in the world today somebody already isn't already dealing with drought, elevated temperatures, and so forth. It's a matter of of uh, figuring out how how to get that to to do that. Well, I'm an optimist, and I would <clears throat> end the presentation with this perspective. I I don't expect to be around necessarily in 2050 to defend what I've said here today. Uh, maybe I should be more optimistic about that. <laughs> well, we yeah. want to be optimistic. Yeah, I, I should be Bob. optimistic. Yeah, that's not that far away. Uh, as I work with students on campus, I realize that uh, that'll be about midpoint in their career. So um, uh, that's it's nearer than you think. But I, I am an optimist. I as I think about our family and the, the lives that our children and grandchildren uh, will have, I, I feel confident that they will be part of a world that has enough food to be stable and, and well-nourished. I wish just that I was 30 years old <laughs> because I think uh, the next uh, few decades are going to be really exciting. Uh, there could be a period of time when there's uh, a lot of anxiety, but I'm, I'm absolutely as humanity has done in the past, we've, we've managed to find solutions that enable us to continue to uh, to grow and to have healthy lives, and I think that that will be the case as well. So I think, Dr. Irwin, with that, I'll close it out and say thank you, and uh, perhaps there's some questions that someone would like to ask. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. 
a lot to think about. We have a number of questions uh, queued up already. Uh, but for those of you that would like to ask uh, additional questions, if anything's prompted, please uh, submit them. We'll get to as many of them as we can in the next 19 minutes. So I'm going to start off with the first question, Bob. So how big of an impact on the beef industry will the growth of plant-based proteins have? For example, uh, this uh, questioner suggests Burger King's Impossible Burger. Yeah. <laughs> Animal scientist, uh, perfect person to Well, I, 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 that. I, you'd appreciate I have a bias, but uh, I, <clears throat> I was in San Francisco back earlier in the, the year mm -hmm. and spent some time with uh, some of the folks who are actually developing these kinds of products. And uh, there's some clever technologies of extracting unique proteins from plant material and converting into, into something and, uh, that's edible and tastes reasonably good. I think the uh, like other things, those place things will find a place in the marketplace and significantly driven by uh, economics if it can be produced at a competitive price and acceptable. My concern as I think about these things is uh, – the meat products, the animal products that we currently have nutritionally are incredibly good in terms of providing not only the protein amino acids and energy that people need, but also some of the micronutrients, which uh, one has to be careful about. Otherwise, you run into malnourished situation. Uh, I think it's just part of the mix. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, it will be interesting to see how those, those unfold. One of the questions I've had, I wonder if you've had a chance to look at this just to help uh, people listening in. Uh, you know, when we think about basic feed efficiency for like um, poultry, pork, and mm -hmm. beef, uh, any idea, you know, are we actually um, more efficient in terms of using the same set of basic inputs to produce plant based? Uh, substitutes versus just going ahead and producing the live animal-based um, proteins? <clears throat> you know, that's an interesting question because if you think about uh, what's called ex vivo meat, which means you grow cells in a mm -hmm. tissue culture, you have to have starting ingredients to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're thinking about doing it in an animal, you feed a fairly raw ingredient in the animal's intestine and bio body. We deconstruct that material and create the ingredients that are mm -hmm. absorbed that become what those cells need to be nourished. Doing that industrially is an expensive process. And so I think one of the challenges, there's no question that one can grow. We've had in vivo cell culture for a long time for science reasons and others. But the challenge is how do you, in fact, create an economical and functional system to produce the starting ingredients that need to be in that, that uh, dish when those cells are growing? Because you, 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 know, you can imagine this in the lab, right. but putting that out on an industrial scale, scale that, yeah, that's that a country that, – Yeah, that's the challenge. You know, how do you, scaling it. How do you in, in some sense, how do you, how, how do you create an intestine, a functional intestine? And liver? Interesting yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Okay. Um, another question that's here it says, uh, this person, this questioner is concerned about international farming disasters. Um, stories about coffee growers being wiped out in Honduras, Guatemala, uh, big cyclones with increasing wave heights, increasing wind strength and duration, and much higher storm surge versus rice. So I, I would – Classified that allows us to get a little bit into the climate change mm -hmm. um, yeah. questions. Uh, that's a, a really big area, uh, but you know, you know, what what are your views uh, to answer that specific question, and uh, what might we likely see in this twenty first century in terms of climate change impacts? You know, on I, food production. I, I think one way of approaching that question, if you think about the hurricane several years ago in New Orleans, Katrina. And the extent to which rice areas, as I recall, were contaminated by seawater and, and made it difficult to produce rice there. Uh, if we have, as a result of climate change, those kind of events becoming more regularized and realizing that we do have quite a lot of our productive soils located at fairly low altitudes relative to the sea level, one can see that as a, as a challenge, I think. 
And the the question, obviously, then do, do do government policies need to be directed to building big dikes to protect this? And you know, I we're certainly aware of what Holland has done throughout its history of creating additional productive lands by by excluding the sea. Uh, but those are are major decisions, and they're incredibly costly as well. Uh, the uh, I I think the uh, the challenge with uh, with climate change is to not become overly captivated by the hyperbole and the catastrophic perspective, but approach the reality that uh, there's likely climate change. There's, that's the history of the planet. Climate change and uh, go about the business of finding solutions to produce in whatever kind of world we're going to live in. Uh, you're aware, Scott, that um, Steve Long, who's a faculty mm -hmm. member on the campus, has done a lot with a free air concentration experiment on the South Farms here where he's been able to, using uh, computational technology to, to do adjustments, create zones where you might have CO2 concentrations that would be equivalent to something that might exist in 50 years, and then grow in a natural environment or an outdoor environment, soybeans. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is that you enrich the environment with CO2, the plant responds. It's kind of a fertilizer to it. But the downside, if that also is accompanied by an increase in temperature, right. which one projects, then you have increased transpiration rates in the plants more vulnerable to drought and lack of water. So, there's a lot of factors going on here that I don't think we fully understand. But the point I would make is that there's science going on, good science being done in laboratories to try to figure out how to deal with these things. And I think it's also important to keep in mind, you know, the economist's perspective is um, agriculture has been uh, adapting to changing environment, changing locations of production uh, literally forever. Sure. And there's lots of adaptation uh, that can occur. Uh, for example, if the higher CO2 is good, yeah. but maybe it's uh, the summers are warmer and have yeah. more frequent droughts. Well, maybe uh, you plant earlier. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, exactly. They, and we're, we'll change the genetics to adapt. It's not saying that, the, that that will be costless, but there are adaptation strategies that we can use. Okay. Next question. Um, let's see. How long do you see the potential for trans for technology advancements in genetics, storage, loss minimization, transportation efficiency, and product transfer to consumer being able to outstrip global demand? Basically, this is a supply versus a demand kind of question, I think. I, you know, the uh, the topic that I was focused on last week in Europe was will there be enough soybeans in 2050 to meet demand if, uh, mm -hmm. for animal production? And uh, so I, I was, before I went over, I was talking to one of our local farmers at a, an event here on mm -hmm. campus. I asked him the question. He says, if the price is right, we'll grow it. <laughs> and so I, I guess I, I have some confidence in the ability of the marketplace to drive the kinds of innovations that are going to make changes that will address these kind of, kinds of issues. Uh, the challenge, and you're more of an expert certainly on logistical systems than I am, I'm very naive, but the challenge with some of these is they require massive investments by the public at large, mm -hmm. not just an individual organization. And sometimes getting those decisions made relative to other priorities is difficult for a society to do. And uh, and they also have very long lead times. Absolutely. It's a, it's a yeah. really important consideration for all of these kind of technology investments. Um, there's some evidence that uh, ag economists are producing is <clears throat> that uh, I think that the folks that I'm thinking of are winning the debate that we're actually in the midst. We don't – here in the Midwest, we, it's hard to imagine that with the yields we've been getting mm -hmm. recently. But overall, in U.S. agriculture, the rate of uh, – Productivity growth is slowing down. I, I was interested. You kind of approached this question a few minutes ago. Uh, crop agriculture has seen a lot of innovation in technology, the, the technology of growing the crop as opposed necessarily to genetics over the last – and I think you've got a nice article on that. Uh, I think the area of animal agriculture, that is virtually an untapped opportunity in mm -hmm. terms of – 
the environment, the well-being of the animals, and mm-hmm. so forth, to use technology to to enhance those kind of parameters. So there's some efficiencies to be gained to gain there. Very interesting. All right, next question uh, asks: Will there be more mass farm or more individual co-op farms or individuals? So it's I guess that's a will all of this. What kind of structure will we see? Maybe both in developed versus developing countries. You know, that's an interesting question. And one of the things that I've speculated about, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, is as we have moved from a world where people were able to procure their foods locally from a local market, Mm -hmm. and having been in developed countries over the years, you, you see people bringing products in for that day's consumption to a situation where the place of production is thousands of miles from the place of consumption. That, to me, seems to be one of the major factors that's driving this scale, change in scale and strange in structure of Mm -hmm. various agricultural um, product uh, systems. Uh, I I believe in in my industry, the swine industry, that has certainly been a factor uh, as you have massive – marketplace, uh, they don't want to deal with thousands of small producers. The, the efficiency is to have a system that's, uh, that's very well coordinated in some, some way. Right. And I, it's hard to see the forces that have been driving um, both crop and animal agriculture to larger and larger mm-hmm. units is going to change. And in fact, I think <clears throat> you can make a good argument that the consumer's desire for traceability and sustainability right. – it is just one more force that will drive the size of production units to be right. larger and larger and larger because it takes a, a pretty large organization typically to provide that kind of uh, traceability and sustainable. And yet you and I both grew up on small family farms right. and, and lament the, the disappearance of that lifestyle. Right. And, you know, that obviously has major impacts on rural communities. Right. And, you know, my uh, – Hometown where I grew up in Iowa is, uh, you know, literally, uh, unfortunately, there's there's not a lot left of it because of all these changes. So Ditto. I certainly feel yeah. that sadness myself. Uh, okay, switching just for a, um, a minute. We still have a few time to get to more of our questions. What effect do you see African swine fever having on how long it will take to use up record global stocks of grain? And how do you see that impacting the price of commodities that are below the cost of production in the U.S. today? That, that's <laughs> a, that's I, I think Bob's going, I shouldn't have read that. That's a question for me. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, the question is uh, how, how bad is the African swine fever uh, outbreak in China? How large of a uh, loss in production capacity are they going to experience? And one that I haven't seen a lot of discussion about is how long is it going to take to get it under control? There's no signs yet that it's really under control. So we're still discovering you know, <clears throat> that size. And then the second part of that answer to that question will be basically Chinese government policy. Are they just going to let the market sort it out? Um, which means you, know, you have substitution with uh, different kinds of uh, feedstocks, uh, um, or excuse me, you'll have different substitution for different kinds of uh, animal protein and you will just basically let the market and the prices uh, uh, sort this thing out. I don't think they're going to do that entirely. Uh, certainly the market and the prices will have an impact. Uh, but I think that the signals are pretty clear that the Chinese government is going to be a major buyer of pork from wherever it's available in the world. Um, how much they can actually use is a good question. Um, the only safe thing to think say at this point is that uh, I believe it will be a net gain for U.S. agriculture eventually. Um, think of it as the equivalent <clears throat> of a big drought over there. But this time it's the animals that got hit instead of crops. And so we're going to probably walk a lot of our soybeans to China or mm-hmm. maybe float them would be the right <laughs> right way to think about it. Uh, and I think uh, – but that will really mean a big hit in our exports, but maybe our production of uh, hogs will um, expand enough so that – but there will be some winners and losers in terms of agriculture versus crop uh, – uh, 
crop agriculture in the U.S. on that question. But how long is it going to take? I think it's probably going to take longer to work uh, through all this than people are currently thinking. I mean, it's a two or three year process to probably fully readjust, assuming they get it under control soon. I think you're right. I think the, the it's clear that you can eliminate the animals, let the facilities set, and repopulate. That's been done. As I, I think I mentioned early on, it was done in the Dominican Republic and on the island of Hispanola. The challenge is putting the policies in place, the, the security in place to allow you to do that, and how long does it take to get that done? And you know, I don't think it's going to happen yeah, in six months. No. I had a sad uh, email from a veterinary friend of mine in China a couple mm -hmm. of days ago. He's actually one of our former students mm -hmm. who's worked there 25 years, I guess. And he said the it seems to be slowing down simply because there aren't any more sows to infect, and oh, that's a sad goodness. commentary. That is yeah. just naturally yeah. kind of like a right. like a forest fire. It's right. finally running out of fuel. Yeah. Uh, great question to end on here, Bob. What would you adv what advice would you tell a student or recent <clears throat> graduate who is considering going back to a row crop farm operation? <laughs> you know, I uh, the, the, I. I guess the as I think about, I'm, I'm involved with an effort around workforce and agriculture, and there are just mm -hmm. not enough people to do the things that need to be done. So my advice is um, uh, certainly give it a really, really good thought to doing that. But what you do may be very different from what your parents did on that farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I, in uh, again, having been recently in Europe, you get caught up with ideas that may be a bit strange, but uh, the demand in that part of the world for uh, organically grown soybeans to feed chickens to produce organic eggs is significant. And uh, I don't know if that's an opportunity for someone or not, but think about other ways that you might, uh, other than just purely commodity, how you find a niche market or do something. I uh, Given the fact that we have uh, the container facilities that we have in this part of the world, at least, and uh, the capacity to 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 actually commit to delivering something that uh, is segregated is is an opportunity. Depends on where the person is, of mm -hmm. course. My perspective on that, when I talk to students here at the U of I, is I I, I give them very similar advice, but I say keep this one thought in mind. And particularly, I couldn't get very many of them to listen to me during the high price, high income years right, that right. we had, you know, five to ten years ago. Uh, remember that for the typical, what we, you call commodity, corn, mm -hmm. soybean agriculture, right. that that is a high volume, low margin business. Right. And it will likely remain that. And so you're going to have to have a strategy for um, getting a toehold in that kind of business and then maybe figure out where you can find and be an entrepreneur for some kind of value-added aspect yep. that, that contributes to that. But you have to recognize that that's the nature of the beast yeah. that you're entering. And uh, that's the long run is that it's uh, high volume, low, low margin. Someone recently said, "Get big or get a bit big, get out or specialize," and I, I, that may be reality. Uh, well, it has been for a long time. It's kind of it's it's painful advice. To, it is, to, uh, you know, and seems uh, very negative. But that's yeah. that's the nature of the the kind of business and market that we deal in. Well, our hour's already up, Bob. Huh? Goodness, it's gone gone well. Thank you very much for well, the opportunity, Scott, and for Farm Well, we Dog. thank you yeah. for uh, being willing to uh, put this together and share your knowledge with everyone. We apologize we couldn't get to everyone's questions. We got to as many as we could. I just want to uh, say that, again, that the video of this uh, presentation and the Q&A will be up at the farm doc webinar uh, site and we will be sending emails out to everyone that was registered with that link and through other vehicles and the complete video and the copy a pdf copy of the slides will be available uh, there as well and we thank everyone for uh, dialing in and we appreciate your time and until the next farm doc webinar we're signing off